Welcome to the Dental Implant Practices Podcast, where each episode will explore how to integrate dental implants into your practice and into bone with your host, Dr. Philip Gordon. Hey guys, thanks for being listening to the show. Go to dentalimplantpractices.com and find all of our resources. Also find us on Facebook, Dental Implant Practices page on Facebook. And go to iTunes and leave me a review on iTunes so we can help spread the message. Thanks. Welcome to another episode of the Dental Implant Practices podcast. I'm your host, Philip Gordon. And today, it's a huge honor for me to introduce Grant Bullis. Grant is the VP of Manufacturing at Glidewell Labs. Grant, thanks for being on the show today. Hey, Philip. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I know you're out in uh, headquarters out there in Glidewell. Um, kind of tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, some of, of your previous kind of work history um, as far as getting into dentistry and then your your transition over to Glidewell and then maybe what you're currently doing uh, at the Glidewell company. Sure. So my, my uh, beginnings in dentistry actually started with dental implants. I was working for a little company in uh, Gravelland, California called uh, uh, Stereos which was originally part of uh, Danar. And um, we were doing dental implants. It was uh, 97. And uh, we were just kind of transitioning from blades to uh, uh, threaded uh, implants. And uh, then we had this uh, nifty little implant we called uh, Nobel, or back then it was just uh, stereo for place. And it was an externally hexed implant. And uh, Jack Hahn was the, uh, was the originator and designer of it. And, and that was really taken off. And as a, a, we worked there for a couple of years, we were purchased by uh, uh, Noble Pharma. And the combined company was called uh, Noble BioCare. That's how the name came up. And, of course, by then we, uh, we rolled in the Brandmark system. We had uh, the Stereos implant line. And we had Replace. And uh, Replace, about that time, came out with the internal connection, the tri connection. That implant system just took off to the moon. I mean, it was incredibly popular. and uh, really. Uh, was as an eye opener to just uh, how much uh, a good implant system, a good design, could really uh, attract uh, uh, people to the implant uh, restoration uh, business. Um, after that, that I uh, worked there until uh, 2005, and shortly after that, I went to uh, Glidewell and I started up the implant uh, division at Glidewell. And uh, I've expanded since then. I, I run a few other uh, horizontal and vertical business divisions, but the uh, the, uh, our focus in the beginning was prosthetics because we're, we're a very large dental laboratory and we restore a lot of different implant systems. And what we were trying to get to was a level invoice for everybody. The invoices varied in the beginning because we would purchase a prosthetic component from the implant companies. The invoices were, you know, they varied between implant company to implant company. And we were trying to get to a, a flat level pricing. So if someone called in and said they wanted a super tank crown, there was one price for that. If they wanted a custom abutment, one price for that. If they wanted a uh, bar over denture, one price for that. So that's really the root of the uh, of, of, uh, beginning of the implant manufacturing at Glidewell. From there, we went into a, a small diameter implant, a more uh, traditional uh, uh, internal hex implant, and then finally on to we're working with Jack Hahn on to the uh, Han tapered implant. And that brings us up to pretty much current day. Great. Now you were brought on um, after some, some pretty awesome uh, times there. I, I mean, I know the, uh, the stereo system developed by Jack Han also, mm -hmm. you know, then rolled into the replace, which was a, the workhorse of dental implants for over a decade uh, across the world. What, what was it like to kind of be um, in those, you know, those beginning eras with, with Nobel BioCare and, um, and then also the the transition to Glidewell, kind of implementing their implant system. I mean, those are pretty huge um, endeavors you've you've taken, and I mean that's that's some pretty awesome stuff. Yeah, I mean for sure when when uh, when we came out with Nobel Place, especially it was always a good seller, but the internal connection really just was another level, and uh, we couldn't make them fast enough. You know, they were they were just that was a good problem to have, and uh, we came out with Tyganite after that, and that really took off. We had some manufacturing challenges because we were now working with a commercially pure titanium instead of uh, alloy titanium, which requires some more uh, finesse on the manufacturing side to make a make a stronger implant. But it, it was a, it was a heyday of implants, I would say. Uh, you know, in the mid two thousands, we were just uh, making implants and uh, and delivering them as fast as we could because the demand was just insatiable. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, uh, you know, I, I love dental implants and uh, you know the the history behind it and where it's at now. And 
Uh, it sounds like you've kind of been there at every step along the way with some of these um, great manufacturers and some of these great leaders. You know, I I want to I want to break down a lot of uh, you know what dental implants are, what they're made of, what the connections are, what the surfaces are in this uh, conversation we're having. But I guess um, you know I I work with uh, the Han system right now as part of my inventory. I've I've, I've met Jack and uh, um, you know been at his office and seen him play some, and I absolutely love uh, that implant. But let's let's kind of talk about you know you being um, the VP of manufacturing. You're in charge of a lot of things. Um, but it, but as you talked about, you know Glidewell's lab, Glidewell uh, lab, you know they're you, you guys are trying to get prosthetics made easy and made simple and bring the price down. And I think that's a great thing. Yeah, we're trying to keep it as predictable as possible for when when you uh, when you're restoring a case, you, you know your costs going in. And I and I think that's great. You know, kind of making making the world flat. You know, so everyone can have a level playing field. At least you know how much to charge. You know, so if you don't know your right your, your bill, how do you know how much to charge? And I think you know a lot of dentists didn't want to do implants because it was confusing. They didn't make a lot of money. It, it took longer than they thought, and, and the bills were extremely high. So they thought, you know, why even bother? Mm -hmm. And nowadays, with the simplification of the processes, the streamlining of the prices, I think it's kind of plug and play uh, for a lot of people. I mean, for sure, experience helps. Absolutely. Um, when, when you're doing it, uh, you know, I, I can understand nervous system trepidation the, the first time, and uh, you want to know that, you know, on the on the laboratory side of things, it's not going to be a surprise, you know. And then in the clinical setting. Uh, that's not our area of, uh, where we can help there other than to give you a product that's going to be very predictable when you use it. So it, it, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, in a clinical setting, is the implant going to be up to the job? Of course, it's going to be up to the job. So, you know, pick your cases, you know, to what you what you feel comfortable uh, uh, working on restoring. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and, then, and then use a lab like Glidewall that has, Lots of experience and lots of text that can help walk you through steps uh, that that you know maybe if, if you don't have a lot of experience the the experience of the lab can really uh, glean a lot on the case by uh, helping point you in the right direction. Yeah, if the implants are in, we'll help you put teeth on them. Absolutely, <laughs> that's the goal. Um, now you guys restore thousands of implants. Uh, uh, I mean, a week, a month. Uh, I, you know, yeah. how, how many how many implants does Glidewell um, restore a year, and and what are the top or, or a month, and, and, and what are the top like five to 10 systems that you see coming in? Obviously, I love the Han system, but I know you guys will, will make prosthetics for anything. What are the top five or 10 systems that you guys receive to, um, to re, you know, to make prosthetics for? Gosh, I mean, number of implants, if you break it down to the fixture level, tens, tens of thousands. Gotcha. Uh, every month. It's, it's so many, it would be hard to break it down to, there's so many of them, multiple unit cases. It's a, it's a long. Um, they come in by the truckload, so um, and they're spread out across overdentures and custom abutments and screw retained crowns and uh, you name it, the, the type of restorations. Um, uh, probably our fastest growing and most popular restoration is a, a monolithic zirconia, what we call a full brutcher, full archer, or just a monolithic zirconia implant bridge. It has really taken off and simplified our life. Uh, we Before, we were doing a lot of uh, bars wrapped in acrylic with denture teeth on it and they're they are a, a real maintenance challenge because the, the teeth can pop off and the acrylic cracks and you know there's a lot of back and forth with them to keep them uh, maintained and when we switched to uh, monolithic zirconia it really revolutionized uh, our ability to deliver a case and have it just stay delivered it, it held up in the mouth and um, the patients liked it it uh it looks decent and the um the, the protocol and the delivery are just a lot simpler than they are with doing a, a bar wrapped uh, overdenture. On the, um, on the, uh, to, to speak to, um, what implant systems we see a lot of, it's the ones you would probably expect, the ones with the largest market share. So we're talking, of course, Han, some of our own products. We're talking, uh, Little Biocare. We're talking Zimmer. We're talking 3i. We're talking Strawman. So the largest implant systems from a few years ago, are still the largest implant system today. However, we do see more, I would say, um, uh, mid-tier systems. And I don't mean mid-tier by quality, but just mid-tier by market share being newer in the market and so forth. We're seeing more um, of some of the Korean companies. We're seeing more of uh, other uh, lower price, like AB Dental and some of the Israeli uh, implant systems. They are slowly uh, infiltrating the market, as well as Neodent, which was purchased by Salmon. They are... Um, they're making inroads in the U.S. market, so it's not as um, it's not as uh, concentrated as it was a few years ago. 
the market is definitely breaking into segments with a premium segment, the mid-price segment, and the value segment of the implant market. And I would say the mid-price and the value segments are probably growing the fastest. I know there's a lot of um, implants out there now. And that, that's kind of what I wanted to talk with you about. Um, you know, because with all those different types of systems, now you have different types of connections. You have different types of uh, prosthetics to make on top of that. Uh, obviously, for the dentist to know about, there's different uh, surgical pieces, there's different restorative pieces. So let's just kind of start from the top, uh, if you would, and we can always kind of reference back to the Han. I think there's a lot of people that maybe don't understand the different types of titanium. So just kind of going back to, to to the basics, phase one, you know, you know, there's there's different ty- there's different types of titanium when you're manufacturing implants. Can you touch? Uh, can you touch on on a on a couple um, uh, of what the basics are? You know, there's there's different grades, and you know, how is that titanium acquired? treated and, and uh, processed? Yeah, sure. So going all the way back to the beginning, and most titanium uh, comes in a raw material, something called titanium response. And that's its raw form after it's been uh, separated from its uh, you know base rock. Most of it comes from Russia. They have the largest uh, amount of titanium in the world, and it's sold uh, all over the world, of course. And then uh, the titanium is further processed into the different shapes. So when you're starting with commercially pure titanium, CP1, uh, CP2, CP3, CP4. Commercially pure titanium 1, commercially pure titanium 4. There's a little bit of uh, um, maybe difference in impurities in the titanium, but both all of them are commercially commercially pure grade, which are essentially pure titanium. They've been uh, rolled and they've, made, they've been worked a little bit to uh, decrease the grain size as you go from CP1 to CP4. They, uh, they come in, they've been pushing their, uh, in their final shapes, whether it's a, a bar or a rod or ingots or whatever you're, whatever you're working with. The implant uh, titanium shape is primarily a bar. So we're buying a, a titanium in 12 foot long bars, which is uh, a function of the machinery that's used to make the implant out of the titanium, which is typically an uh, automatic lathe. Uh, commercially for, uh, pure grade or CP1 through CP4, and they have around 80 to 100,000 um, uh, uh, PSI or KSI uh, yield strength. Pretty good. You remember the original brown uh, implants, which have a uh, you know decades of service life, were all made from commercially pure titanium. Uh, Nobel, the Nobel uh, replace implants to this day, the brown implants to this day, are made from a uh, uh, a worked CP grade of titanium. It's done a little special for them. They they uh, run it through a little bit more uh, uh, processing. To reduce the grain size more and get more strength, but it's still, uh, you know, titanite and all the titanite surface is done on a commercially pure titanium. We tried to do it on alloy titanium, uh, aluminum, vanadium, alloy titanium, but the titanite comes out a little bit brown. Do that doesn't look good. So uh, <laughs> that was another starter. The uh, so all the uh, Nobel implants are made out of uh, commercially pure titanium, specially treated to uh, enhance the strength and reduce the grain size. They go together. <laughs> when you're using the alloy titanium. Most of it is uh, grade 5 and grade 23, which is called 6AL4B, 6 aluminum, 4 vanadium, alloy percent with the, with the uh, titanium. And those alloys serve to stabilize the grain structure. Uh, they add uh, more mechanical properties to the titanium. They add more uh, ultimate yield strength, and they add uh, better fatigue properties to the titanium. The grade 5 is kind of the commercial workhorse of the titanium industry. More grade 5 titanium is made. Uh, than any other types combined. It's used in aerospace, it's used uh, in medical, it's used in dental. It has a very high strength, around 130,000 uh, PSI ultimate yield strength, whereas uh, grade 23, which is called ELI, or extra little interstitial, is a higher purity form of grade 5. It has about 10,000 less uh, yield strength, but quite a bit higher than commercially pure titanium. But it has better, a little bit better ductility and has better fatigue properties. The, uh, the Han implant is made out of grade 23 titanium because we want the, uh, the better fatigue properties. We don't want under cyclic loading or fatigue loading, we don't want the implant to get embryo over time. So you can chew on it and it gives a little bit, and, uh, and that gives us the uh, fatigue properties that we want. There's a uh, grade 19 titanium, and I don't want to throw out, you know, there's, there's probably 30 different grades of titanium, but. Grade 19 is a zirconia alloy, zirconia, not zirconium, zirconia, the metal alloy. And that has similar properties to grade 23. It has a good fatigue resistance. It has good uh, yield strength. It's uh, it's right in there 
in that kind of sweet spot of uh, titanium alloys. And then there's just a, a ton of others that have niobium and, and a bunch of other uh, materials added to them. Most of the other alloys uh, are alloyed for corrosion resistance or um, thermal stability or something else. You know, the, the, the main, uh, the main uh, titanium alloys are uh, the aluminum vanadium alloy, which is a grade 5 and 23, commercially pure grades, and um, the kind of a niobium zirconium alloys around the grade 19 area. So those are, those are the main alloys that are used for dental implants. They have the right mechanical properties that would make them good for, uh, for uh, real small uh, dental implants. They're going to get chewed on all the time. They're going to have a lot of cyclic voting. So that's kind of how the, uh, the material selection goes for that. Uh, we all know that titanium integrates well, so it's, it's going to be a titanium alloy of some sort. They have other implants, of course, made on zirconium peak, but they're kind of a niche segment. Uh, 99% plus of the of dental implant market is uh, titanium uh, and titanium alloy implants. Gotcha. Do you know, um, obviously, you, you know that Noble BioCare is, uh, you said a CP4, right? It's, it's a special, uh, it's a specially uh, cold work version of CP4 to add a little more, to reduce the grain size and, and increase the strength on it. Yeah. It's stronger than CP4. Okay. So it's stronger. And then, um, do you know what other implant companies are using? Like you said, like Neodent or Stroman, do you know what, what they're using? Neodent, uh, Stroman, this is, uh, CP, uh, for, or I, I believe it's CP4, but they use it for mostly pure grade titanium for most of their implants. For their, uh, bone layer, they use a, uh, uh, it's a kind of niobium alloy on those because uh, when you get down to real small diameters, like a, a 3.3 for a uh, narrow cross set, uh, CP titanium just isn't strong enough. Okay. So then they, they went to an alloy titanium for more strength. Okay. So kind of depends on manufacturer even. You know, they may have different types of materials they use depending on the size uh, or, or, or the type of implant, maybe internal hex or external hex or... You know, so there's not just one type of titanium that's used. It's kind of dependent on, you have different companies, different makes, and then different sizes even. Correct. Yeah, I mean, when you get down to very small sizes, it's hard to do uh, CP implants if you want a two-piece implant. One-piece one implant, you can go pretty small before you have a problem. Well, let's go to, um, okay, so you said the Han is a type of a, of a, of a G23 with... Um, kind of an increased purity for better fatigue properties. And um, so that stabilizes well for the Han. But let's talk about um, surface treatments. You know, everybody's got a different type of surface treatment, it seems like. Um, and everybody's trying to outprove different surface treatments. Kind of walk me through, um, you know, what what are the different main type of surface treatments used? I mean, um, I know we touched about tie Unite. Can you talk about what tie Unite actually is? I, I don't know if anybody actually knows what that is. It's like, you know, it's it's this it's this magical word, and then there's you know HA coated, and there's there's blasted and etched. I mean, you know, I mean, a guy looking at a at a screw is thinking, okay, it's a, it's a titanium screw. Um, maybe I understand the, the different types of titanium because I get that. But you know, what what's on the surface? What's under the microscope? And and, and why is everybody doing something different? Yeah, if we want to make things really confusing, we can throw in lots of histology pictures, right? Oh yeah, yeah, so, lots of lots of crazy yeah. stuff. I mean, the implant surfaces. Uh, you know, if we go all the way back to Branamark, which works, by the way, and it's been around for decades, uh, they use a machine titanium surface, period. You know, their, their surface was machine titanium. And uh, moving, moving uh, off of machine titanium uh, in, the, in the 90s and uh, late 80s, there were really three uh, kind of main surfaces. We used, uh, we used them all at Stereos. We used uh, acid etching, which would... Uh, Get a little more surface area and uh, kind of passivate the surface. Uh, give a bone a little bit more to hang on to. We used uh, HA coated, hydroxyl apatite. Those are still sold today. I believe Zimmer sells them uh, as MTX and, and so forth. Uh, their uh, implant direct sells um, uh, as uh, also sells an HA coated implant. Probably a few others. And then uh, we had TPS, titanium plasma spray. What we found is uh, HA coated implants work very well. The bone has a tremendous affinity for, for HA. Um, as long as you can keep uh, the uh, implant submerged below the level of HA, uh, we found that you know once the uh, if the, uh, we had any kind of uh, infection or we lost the bone to the level of HA, then we didn't have a problem because uh, they, were, they were very susceptible to peri implantitis. Uh, once once the uh, the bone if the bone receded to the HA level and below, it, we had a big machine collar on top of it. 
which tend to uh, hold the bone and hold the bone level and keep the HA a lot of really fast healing and the bone really grew that well. Uh, we found with the machine titanium, they were uh, about on par with the machine implant. The, the acid etched, uh, displane machine titanium and acid etched, it was pretty hard to differentiate the uh, advantages there. I don't think the acid edge surface was really rough enough. We kind of found after, over time that a roughness between, say, 1.15 and, and 1.5, 1.6 was kind of a sweet spot for for implants. In that area, the, uh, the bone uh, liked that particular texture for whatever reason, and it, it grew up against the, uh, the implant, and it uh, integrated well. Too rougher than that, we started getting some problems. TPS has challenges, and we uh, ultimately, ultimately uh, discontinued that at Stereos because we were having some difficulties with uh, failures of oxygen integration, and uh, the success rates with TPS implants were, were low enough relative to the other implant uh, surfaces that we just uh, decided to discontinue it. The uh, uh, AC blasted, or the roughness surfaces, is just a, a, a way of increasing the amount of uh, surface area uh, that's available to bond to bone. So the more area of bone implant contact you can have, the better off you are, as long as you're not going too rough. And we learned that about the one five one six was the upper limit of how rough we wanted to go. And below 1, 1.15, uh, we're starting to lose the benefits of having the surface area to uh, the bone to uh, grow up against. Uh, the, that, that particular texture in between there are a lot of different ways to achieve it. Uh, one of the common methods is just blasting the silica, uh, which you think is just, you know, think of a, a, a blaster in a, um, in a laboratory or, or even an office. You're, you're roughing up the surface by sandblasting uh, with silica. And when you're doing implants, you have to have specialized equipment because you're, you're blasting into the threads. So if you blast straight at an implant, you, you won't hit the flank of the threads correctly. So we have, we have specialized machinery that has uh, nozzles at different angles that adjust, and, uh, hits a thread so that the threads are blasted evenly and not, you know, just on the edge of the threads or it misses the bottom of the threads and so forth. And then, of course, we mask off the top of the machine tower because we don't want to roughen that surface. And I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. And uh, the other thing we looked at when we, when we blast implants, so we've got uh, TPS a little too rough. We've got machined, which doesn't have as much area uh, available for bone implant contact. We've got machine and acid etched, which still doesn't offer that much advantage. And we've got a uh, blasted in, uh, implant surface, uh, which offers that, that reference gradient that we want. We've got a um, anodized implant surface. This is one I haven't talked about too much, and that's what uh, Tyanite is. It's an anodization process. The implant is hooked up to a, an electrode, and a, a, a current is passed through it, and it anodizes the surface of the implant the extent that it, it actually roughens the implant. It has these pores that come out as the implant uh, anodizes. And if you watch it to the side of the, uh, the tank while it's being anodized, it sparks. You see all these sparks and, and electrical uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, almost like lightning bolts dancing across the surface of the implant. And it's anodizing the surface and roughening the surface that way. And that has a pore size that fits in that gradient that bone really, really likes to adhere to. So between anodizing, blasting, t- titanium plasma spray, uh, acid etched and machined, and just plain machine, you have those are the five main types of implant surfaces. People have uh, other surfaces where they um, they add different things to the implant surface. They talk, of course, of you know before you put the implant in the mouth, people are you know dipping them in uh, you know, saline to try to get the implant wetted first. And then so that the uh, the blood will kind of wick up the implant. You want a, a surface that's rough and it has low surface tension, something that's very hydrophilic, and and you can achieve that with uh, with blasting and uh, and acid etching afterwards, which is which is what we do with the Han uh, implant system. It's, it's blasted with. The other thing is uh, when you look at the uh, implant surfaces is what's left over after you're done processing, right? We started with alloy. What are we going to have when we're done? If we're HA coated, of course, we want HA on there, the high crystal content. If we're going to blast the surface, after we etch it, we don't want anything left on the surface. We want to be back to that titanium, titanium alloy or titanium surface. And um, one of the challenges we see with, with silica and blasting with you know, traditional blasting is that 
you never can get that stuff all the way out. You really have to be aggressive with the acid etching and post processing to try to get out, out all of those silica grains because they tend to embed themselves in the titanium just like a, they just stab themselves in there and they're, and they're stuck. And then you can ultrasonic uh, clean them. You can put them in acid and, and try to passivate them, but they're, they're, they're difficult to remove afterwards. And uh, one that's how uh, the HA blasted surface came about is, well, one of the safest media to blast an implant surface with is HA. After all, we use HA for HA coating the implants to begin with. If you blast an implant with HA, all it has left on the surface after blasting is HA. And HA dissolves in acid very easily as a calcium phosphate. So when you put it in the uh, the acid etching afterwards, it removes all the HA and uh, and leaves a nice, very clean, very hydrophilic uh, surface. So I hope I haven't lost anybody along the way here. I've gone on a little bit about this, but that's kind of kind of how the surfaces break down. Yeah, excellent. That's that's fantastic. So um, you know, you kind of walk through a, a nice progression there. You know, just to be clear, the Han implant you said it was blasted, blasted and acid etched. Um, yes, it's HA blasted and acid etched. Okay, so it's HA blasted and acid etched. What's mm-hmm. the as, what's the acid that you're etching it with? Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, a solution of hot nitric acid. Okay, and then after that, obviously the uh, the collar is machined. It's not um, polished. It's it's a machine collar. It's a machine collar. Yeah. So so bone so bone can grow to the machine collar, but it, but it but it serves as a protector in case there's certain amount of bone loss it doesn't get down to the threads um where it where it kind of um maybe would be lost quicker yeah i mean it has a, a couple of, of functions uh there's a piece of uh, jack in the system because he'd seen uh implants he put in the original stereos implant had a four millimeter machine power so i mean if you look at uh, the early uh, stereos they got a couple of the old flat tops laying around i mean there's a lot of machine collar there. You know, if you got a 10 millimeter implant, it's like half of the implant is a machine collar. And uh, we noticed that the bone grew up against it just like it was like a biomark implant. It's also a machine the surface. But because of that machine collar, it allows you a little bit of flexibility and placement. If you need to have a little bit super crustal, it's not a big deal. And the soft tissue seems to adapt a little bit better to the machine surface than it does a little rougher surface. So if you've got a highly curved ridge, and a lot, and a lot of them are, it's, it's harder to sink the implant completely down. Because if you if you're on the top of the crest, your implant will be flush. It'll be sticking out the sides as the, as the crest curves. If you sink it deep enough to to have the implant completely submerged, you're going to have it well below uh, crestal on the top of the ridge. So the machine uh, collar allows you that placement flexibility. The soft tissue adapts to it really well. It's very hygienic, and um, you know, it's just kind of a feature that we had lost over time. We had gone away from that and started texturing everything all the way to the top and uh, and really not look back. And, and Jack kind of brought us back to that. He said, you know, I had the best best success I ever had with um, implants that had four millimeter machine collars. I said, well, Jack, four is a bit much. <laughs> Can we do like one? So that's how the Han implant ended up with the, with the machine collar. It's, it's, a, it's a more hygienic surface. In the uh, in the environment where you're, you know, it's, it's exposed to maybe transitory contact, you know, brushing or or something where you're, you know, you're actually kind of in that in that transition zone in the oral cavity where it, it's not as likely for plaque and stuff to adhere to a machine collar as it would be something rougher, and that's kind of where the, the problem starts or the problem doesn't start. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I think you know, it's just kind of looking at okay, what's what's the environment of the of the uh... The bone and tissue like and uh I, you know i agree with you i'd, I'd rather have something if it was going to be exposed or transition rather it be smooth than rough so i i actually think it's great that that they've gone back to that and reintroduced it because uh i can think of a lot of cases where it would um you know stabilize things a lot better to have a little bit of that machined uh surface at the top so you know i, I definitely commend you for that oh thank, thank you jack he was he was he was pushing at the heart. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so we've got surface treatment. You know, obviously, um, you know, another thing we look at is is type of connections. I I think you know that that can be confusing for a lot of people. You know, what what are the major types of connection connections? I know a lot of systems maybe copy various uh, connections to say uh, c- compatible, if you will. Um, there's certain degree of okay, we kind of know what kind of connections work best these days. Can, can you kind of walk me through the progression of connections over the years? Obviously, uh, you know, most things started external hex. Most things are internal now. And and there's there's there might be five or six or seven kind of top uh, common connections. So kind of walk me through 
um, how the connections evolved, why the Han implant is what it is, and, and what are the other common connections available today? Yes, I mean, the, the first connection, when, the one we started with, was, was no connection at all. The old stereo flat top implant. It didn't have a, it didn't have a connection at all. So uh, uh, moving, moving up from that, we started, uh, the connection has kind of uh, evolved for a couple of reasons. One was, uh, uh, in most cases, the connection is used to actually drive the implant into the bone. As part of as part of the uh, driving service, and the second thing, it was made to work with stock prosthetics. When you take a uh, implant that has a connection, and the prosthetics are indexed to that, then if you turn the implant and you place it the right way, usually it's a flat to the buckle or some other feature to the buckle. Um, the stock prosthetics are made to uh, and be anatomically correct for that position to uh, to fit in there. So if you've got an angle abutment, it's a flat to the buckle. It's a 15 degree say uh, angle abutment to the anterior. It's designed that that 15 degree angle will be straight on to the facial, and you'll be able to have you have the least amount of work to uh, to modify it and restore your tooth. So index uh, connections became important for when we started coming out with you know uh, prosthetics that were made for uh, specific anatomical uh, situations. The other thing is with uh, uh, the index in the future is, is that when you uh, there, there's a there's a, a lot of different geometries out there. I mean, uh, Nobel replaced, and uh, there's a trilobe and catalog, of course. Uh, both share that kind of triple triangular index uh, feature on them. Uh, Drahman uh, regular cross fit has four. Inter interestingly enough, their uh, the regular uh, neck and their uh, wide neck implants, uh, the old Lederman screws, uh, have eight. So when they went to the cross fit connection, they dropped from four to eight. Um, that's another connection site. Bicon, of course, is uh, is not in deck, but it has a, uh, a Morse taper, a, a true Morse taper, where you know when you tap the two pieces together, the, the connection and the joint is pretty much permanent. You're not really going to get them apart. So uh, again, it's, uh, um, Bicon is one of the very very earliest implant designs. It doesn't have any indexing, but it has its connection is a Morse taper. Morse taper is actually talked about a lot these days in, in terms of conical connection. A true Morse taper is, is a very, 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 very shallow taper. And the uh, implant sections uh, that I see today, with the exception maybe Bicon, are really not true Morse tapers. They are close fitting tapers, but they're not a Morse taper. A Morse taper an implant, I mean, if you screw it together with an uh, abutment, it's not coming apart. Whether you want to or not, I mean, it's it's from, it's used for like railroad real, real wheels and so forth. They're not they're not coming apart. That's a permanent connection. You would need a plywood pole or something to get it, get it apart. It would not be pretty. So. The, the connection types after that, we break into what we call an internal hex or a conical uh, connection, which are the most popular today. You see a lot of internal hex connections like Zimmer, uh, BioHorizons, uh, Implant Direct, uh, MIS-7, the uh, inclusive implant that we manufacture, uh, or just our, our standard tapered implant. A couple of others, all of them use a, uh, what I call internal hex implant, which is a variation of the old... Uh, Paragon uh, connection. We have a two and a half millimeter hex, uh, 45 degree uh, uh, taper above it. This is a shallow hex connection. Works really well, almost bulletproof. Uh, never have a problem with that. Um, and then you have what we call a conical connection now, which gets a lot of buzz. And uh, it's a very good, uh, good uh, impact connection. It, it moves the uh, indexing feature and, and the connection down a little further inside the implant, so it's more resistant to tipping forces. Uh, it feels more stable when you're putting it in because instead of the driver being right at the top of the implant and the driving forces and, and, and uh, kind of wiggling being at the top of the implant, it's laying on the side of the implant. So when you've got the implant on the, on the driver, it just feels more solid when you're trying to put it in. The uh, other advantage of the conical connection is your prosthetic interface between the implant and the uh, abutment is much longer and more stable. You know, you've got a lot of interlocking area between on the conical connection implant. Uh, an example of conical connection implant would be uh, one of the originals, Astra. The Astra speed was one of the early ones. Um, Noble Active. Uh, Neodent, of course, Han. Um, uh, a few others, AB Dental. Uh, those are all conical connection implants. They have a long conical section, and they have a connection at the bottom of it, for, which is the uh, prosthetically indexing feature and a dry feature. The indexing uh, connection on, on uh, most prosthetics is there for just that. 
it really doesn't do much except orient the prosthetics. It's the depth of the connection and the interlocking uh, surfaces that do the, the real work of, of supporting the prosthesis and taking the load, the indexing the connection, the hex at the bottom or the square at the bottom or the octagon at the bottom or so forth. That's there to index the prosthetics or as a, possibly a drive surface to drive the implant in. Other than that, it doesn't have a lot of functional as far as, far as the uh, everyday function of the prosthetic. The load is taken by the implant and the uh, abutment on the uh, mating surface, it's not by the indexing feature. It also serves to um, reduce uh, rotation, you know, between the two components to uh, kind of mitigate screw loosening. But on a conical connection implant, there's so much surface area in contact, it's not um, prone to rotate or have uh, micro motion very much. So um, of all the connections, uh, I would have to say that, you know, I lean towards the conical connection because of just a, a number of advantages it has for supporting a prosthesis. Yeah, and, and we have to remember it's, uh, you know, it's got to make a good connection, but you also have to be able to, uh, you know, put a tooth on top or put a bridge on top. So there's, 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 there's more to it than just getting a good fit. You know, it's got to support uh, the main function, which in the end is obviously replacing a tooth. It's not just about putting screws in people's heads. Now, the, the conical connection, kind of describe uh, the Han uh, has the same connection uh, as the Noble Active. Um, tell me about the angles um, involved with that. I, I think some people hear about these angles. They don't, they don't know what they mean, and it, it's kind of tough to, to talk about. You, you kind of have to visualize it, but, but what are the angles that you hear about? What are the, what are the numbers that you hear? Yeah, around the seven-degree mark, you know, uh, off, off the center. That's, that, that's, the, that's about the angle. Some are shallower, you know, different implant systems. Some are, some are uh, wider, but in, in that range between seven degrees to 12 degrees, someone, that's, that's where most conical connections fall. Um, we do a lot of different projects, and anywhere in that range, frankly, is fine. Um, it's a matter of preference uh, and, and design. But the uh, most important thing is that the, uh, the, there's a good fit between the prosthetic and the implant. So if you've got a corresponding angle on the implant, uh, the internal angle, your prosthetic needs to fit snugly up against that with no mismatch. And, and that's really the, the main... Uh, uh, and, you know, think consideration. So you talk about compatible, you talk about whether something fits or not, you know, put them together, slice it in half, and the two conical surfaces should be in intimate contact with each other. And that's how you uh, evaluate it. About seven degrees, seven and a half degrees, up to 10, 12 degrees is, is what you'll see for most conical uh, condition, uh, you know, implant about the interfaces. Uh, and then the depth of the, of the interface uh, varies quite a bit between manufacturers, whereas Astro or somebody is very, very deep. Uh, Noble Active a little less so, but still quite deep. And then some, um, you know, are, are significantly less deep. But the all of the chemical connections, I would say, at least have a, a two or three millimeters or more between the top of the implant and where you start the uh, the indexing feature down below, and that really provides that stability. You know, the implant and the uh, abutment are in contact over a, lo a long longitudinal area. It allows them to, to fit together. Just imagine, um, you know, if you put something uh, on top of a table and, you know, you go to push it over, say, a pencil or something, or if you put something down inside a, a couch cushion or something, two or three millimeters, and then try to push it over. The resist resistance to tipping forces is, is much higher in, in the conical connection implants. And, uh, and it makes it inherently... Um, stronger uh, connections, particularly if you're you know, you're in the back of the mouth and maybe you're cantilevering one molar off the back or you're cantilevering one premolar off the back. You know, having an uh, implant and an abutment that go deep down inside, so what, what's the first thing they do when they, when they build a pier or something is they drive a piling as deep as they can, right? They want they want that piling down deep. The further they can drive it into the ground and the further it's supported on to either side and laterally, the stronger that, that pier is going to be if they're resisting wave motion or low, the down or lows. Same thing with the implant and, and the abutment. You want the abutment down inside the implant, and the implant up, up alongside the abutment. So they're basically, they feel like one piece. It gives it much stronger uh, ability to resist the tipping forces and the lateral loads, off axis of loads, when somebody's chewing. If you had an implant under, directly underneath every tooth, which isn't practical in, in almost every case, yes, you'd be able to, uh, everything would be well supported. But in reality, I mean, you usually have uh, several implants in the mouth, maybe four, five, six, and 
you've got to support a dozen teeth on those. So guaranteed, something's going to be loading off the axis of the implant a little bit. And the conical connection helps to uh, stabilize uh, and resist those loads that are off the axis of the implant. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I love the conical connection. Um, that's the, the line of connection that I place, which is why I enjoy the Han. Um, it's, it, it's a great connection. I feel like uh, surgically and prosthetically, it just makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and I think all the studies show that the conical connection is, is one of the more superior connections out there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely a wise choice to, uh, that you guys made with that implant system. And the other, the other thing I would, I would talk, I mean, I don't know if we have any time for threat design and so forth. Yeah, the implants absolutely. That, 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 that's what I was going to ask you about next was, you know, kind of thread design and, and uh, you know, shape and all that. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a big proponent on, uh, on a relatively aggressive thread design. The, uh, the, the really critical thing, nothing can happen, an Austrian integration can't take place if the implant is moving around. It's really just in, pretty much impossible for bone to grow up against a moving target. The implant has to be stable. And uh, I, I found that the, the key to primary stability is a, is a thread that, that really engages the bone and just locks everything down. And um, the, that's one of the things that, that we really worked on with the Han. I would say above all other things is the, the size of the machine collar, which was a, kind of a legacy you know, feature, was we wanted a, a thread that would provide maximum primary stability. And that's we put a lot of effort in that design. We made dozens and dozens of prototypes to get that thread just right. So the thread goes in, it, it has high primary stability, and the other feature that's critical is it goes where you point it. So things are things that are complicated and bloody enough during surgery without an implant trying to walk off in some other direction you don't want it to go. And um and, and Jack was absolutely adamant about that, you know, when you it has to grab and it has to go where you point it. it to, and, and grabbing giving that primary stability and going where you point it means it, it literally goes where you point it. He does a, a lot of uh, immediate replacements in the anterior, immediate extraction, immediate replacement uh, implants. And for him, he, his thing is, you know, eight, number eight, number nine, when you put that implant in, you want to put it up against the, uh, the lingual wall of the osteotomy, and you want to stay against that lingual wall. You want to avoid the buckle plate at all costs. And, it, and this implant was designed to grab the lingual wall and uh, engage the lingual wall and go right where you point it. It was will, it will, designed not to walk outwards and, and hit the buckle plate. If, if you, you engage the lingual wall, you, you point some direction, and that implant goes right there. It does not wiggle around. It doesn't go in a corkscrew motion. It goes where you point it. But it still has to have prime, high primary stability. So we came out with a special thread design that would um, do, do all of those things. It has very, very high primary stability, uh, especially in a uh, you know, softer bone. And it has very, very, uh, I guess you want to say, good guidance when you put it in. It will go where, where you point it, where, where you want it to go. Uh, so you can get an aggressive thread design that will, um, you can go too aggressive, we're actually going to be in danger of fracturing bones and and, uh, and breaking plates uh, when you put them in. You can go too little, in which case um, you just don't have the primary stability because the engagement with the bone is not there. So trying to get the sweet spot was was one of the things that we we worked on uh, a great deal with this with uh, with the Han uh, with the Han implant. We have other implants that that uh, that have good thread designs. Um, I think Han is just uh, is just outstanding as far as the, the primary stability. That the sweat design affects your primary stability and, and, and ease of use and a few other things, but it, it's important to have a, a good aggressive uh, thread that allows you predictable placement and high primary stability. If the implant is moving after you put it in, it's, it's not going to integrate. And if you want an immediate load or do the all on four or some of the other, other protocols, you've got to have an implant with high primary stability. So the tapered design of the Han and the thread design give it that high primary stability. And that, I think, is really, with every implant system you're talking about, primary stability is critical for healing and for loading and for, uh, you know, reducing it as a failure. You've got to have the primary stability. And I think the single most, uh, the two most uh, uh, important things are the shape of the implant. 
You want a tapered implant, you don't want a straight implant. A straight implant won't have as high a primary stability. It won't wedge itself in as good. And then you want a thread design that has a very, very good engagement with the bone without breaking the bone or going someplace you don't want it to go while you're trying to place it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with uh, you know your your affinity for the high primary stability. I think that's one of the most important things with placing implants. Um, I don't know if that's emphasized enough. I, I think it is more and more now, but um, I, I, th- I think initially people were maybe kind of uh, lenient to put a lot of pressure and you know really get these high Newton torque uh, values upon placement. But I, I think that's the most important thing is uh, if if that implant doesn't bite. And then grabbing that bone, and if it's not rock solid, I, I think that's where you're going to run into problems. I think if, if you bury it in bone, you know, there's there's no thread exposures, and that thing's rock solid going in, I think you're going to have great chance. You know, looking back, it's been okay, like you talked about, if, if the if the bone is sloped, or there's exposed threads, or if it if it didn't torque out well, that's where, you know, issues happen. And, and, and I love the primary stability with the Han implant. Um, you know, I used to place a lot of uh, Nobel Replace, and I like that implant. But it wasn't quite aggressive enough for me. Um, you know, then I switched over to the Noble Active, and now I place a lot of the Han. And, and I feel like it's got that good balance of, you know, it's not, you know, you can place it in both arches, but I love, you know, undersizing in the maxilla or osseodensifying and then placing that Han because I can, I can get, you know, torque bodies of 50, 60, 70 Newtons torque um, and know that, you know, that, that implant is not going to budge. And then, you can, then you're allowed the flexibility, like you said, with, um, you know, a lot of people are doing immediate load now to, uh, you know, to put teeth on uh, the same day, whether it's full arch or, um, you know, in the anterior to start shaping that tissue. I think that's more and more important is, is are you getting that tapered implant with the aggressive thread? Um, and I, I think that's, that's definitely where the trend is going. And I, I think that's definitely where it needs to be. Yep, I agree. That's, that's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a current future of implant dentistry. You know, next year, who knows? But right now, that's, that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, do you do you see a, a market for the uh, for the blade implants anymore? I know uh, there's some companies kind of going back into making those. Do you guys see uh, any developments in Glidebowl with that? Do you guys um, get a lot of those in to restore? Is that is that something you see a comeback? We don't um, uh, get a, get any blade implants that I know of in to restore. But I think that might be a little bit self selecting because we weren't really known as an implant lab back in the heyday of uh, blade implants. So I think you know there are some some folks are using a lab like Root or somebody that you know, has has a long history of restoring those type of implants. You know, somebody to be be comfortable with. So um, there's a few designs out there that are um, uh, you know kind of contemporary blade designs. Uh, there's there's a, there's a place for a lot of different types of implants, blades. Uh, blades do work. Um, we haven't really done them uh, much since the mid '90s. Uh, yeah, uh, even uh, I was at a conference with Jack. I think it was over in Pittsburgh for AID, and we were talking. It was a severely, uh, severely atrophic mandible, and they were saying, "Well, how would you restore this?" And Jack said, "Why well, put a subperiosal on it?" <laughs> so, you know, that's that's always an option. But yeah, not not popular, not widely used in, used anymore uh, compared to the screw type implants. They're still out there, uh, but we don't see them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, as far as zygomatics are concerned, um, I know maybe uh, those are used a lot in the uh, all-on four or all-on six cases. Um, what's what's the advantage there for the external connection? Why why isn't there an internal connection for the zygomatics yet? Is is that a silly question? Uh, no, it's not. That's not a silly question. I honestly don't know. I, I don't know. We they're very rare the cases that we see. Um, a lot of the doctors who uh, do them uh, big practices, like say Ed Bedrosian or somebody. I think they have their own uh, in-house lab or, or there's a lab right next to them. So they, um, they work very closely with a few people to restore these. Um, they're, um, they're a specialty implant, you know, definitely not for everybody. It's, uh, it's not a procedure to be undertaken lightly. Uh, the people who do use them can do some amazing things with them. Um, absolutely uh, astonishing restorations. Uh, we don't really see them much. I think you know, we're, we're seen as more of a production laboratory in that respect. And to work with uh, an oral surgeon or a facial reconstruction project, which is a lot of times the case with the uh, with zygoma implants, really requires um, a, a degree of coordination, probably proximity to, instead of us, as a, it's more of a mail order lab that that um, you know, doesn't really lend itself to uh, restoring a lot of zygoma cases. So 
I, I really don't know why they don't have an internal faction. Kind of long since been out of touch with the engineers over in uh, at that Nobel that they would know where I could ask. Uh, but uh, I think it, it because the external faction works and um, is a specialty enough implant that they probably don't do a lot of them every year. I'm going to guess that the production volumes are pretty low. You know, there's a there's a lot of hoopla about the uh, the price of implants nowadays. You know, a lot of people look at like cars and say, uh, you know, if you're buying a more expensive implant, you're getting um, a better product. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, you know, I, I don't know why um, different systems are based differently on price. You know, a lot of it has to do with the company structure and the amount of, uh, you know, rep, reps they have and, um, you know, all the advertising that they may do and whether, um, you know, you've got some older established companies that really cater towards a, a specialty uh, group and you've got some of these mid and uh, uh, price point advantages that may be going after um, more general dentists or um, uh, more reasonable price points. You know, what's the what's the sweet spot for dental implant pricing? Why is there such variability? I mean, at the end of the day, if if most people are uh, using similar machines and using similar titanium, you know, where's where's the big fluctuation in that? And and, and what are your thoughts on that? You know, having worked for, you know, multiple different implant companies. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much you pretty much uh, got it got it earlier. Um, you know, you're, you're paying uh, a premium for marketing and and, uh, and sales and, and support. Um, and then you're paying for, you know, uh, uh, other things that maybe the implant companies support or, or, or use as kind of adjunct marketing organizations like ITI and, and so forth. Those things are, are not inexpensive. But yeah, I mean, there are definite uh, kind of tiers of, of uh, pricing. I think once you get to a certain price, it's really hard to come down from it because you build revenue projections and you, and you build compensation plans and you build uh, marketing budgets around that price point. So there was a heyday in uh, early mid 2000s where implant prices could move up aggressively year over year. If you have three or four hundred dollar implants out there in the marketplace, and that was kind of the, the de facto implant price, if you will, from the uh, large uh, uh, early implant companies. And it, I think it's just really difficult to move off that price, right? There's, there's shareholders, there's revenue expectations built in. And uh, those revenue expectations are both around selling three hundred fifty dollars in class. You know, nowadays with some of the conglomerations uh, and mergers, you know, obviously Danaher now owns Nobel and Implant Direct, so they have you know their um, their their top tier line with Nobel and the legacy that they have. But they also have a, a mid market player with Implant Direct. Um, you know, and the Strawman Group uh, has recently, in the past couple of years, required one hundred percent of Neodent, which is uh, kind of a another. A large implant company, but um, kind of in that middle tier pricing. And then you've got, uh, you know, Henry Shine, which had Camlog, and then you know um, the uh, merger with BioHorizons. Uh, so you know you're seeing a lot of these um, kind of middle markets being uh, uh, these these uh, price uh, lower implants being gobbled up by the bigger implant companies. And I'm not sure if that's one to uh, minimize their competition or to two be able to offer. Um, kind of both the high end and the middle tier implants. So they say, okay, well, if you're not interested in A, maybe you would, you'd be interested in B. I, I'm not sure what your thoughts are with that and where you see some of that heading. I, I think you're going to see more of it. You know, it's, it's going to, uh, for people who are, are starting in the implant industry, is every year there's more, more and more uh, general practitioners, dentists and specialists doing implants. And um, they're not necessarily starting with a uh, with a Nobel, or they're not necessarily starting with a, a Strawman or a 3i. They're very often starting with a with a Han or, or something like that. And um, you know, I think there'll there'll be uh, there'll be downward pressure on on uh, the higher uh, and the more expensive implants, uh, what they call a premium segment. It's going to face downward pricing pressure. Um, you know, they, they have a, a choice, I guess, to you know, give up share or which I don't think they're gonna to want to do. Lower pricing, also not very attractive. Or, you know, have a uh, another offering. It's uh I think more more difficult internally when you have say a a, a neodent and a strong and or implant direct and a a, a normal biocare and they, they have alternate sales forces in the same territories, right? So, you know, how how they work that out is uh, is a complicated question. That's not my problem. It's um, it, it's going to be uh, interesting, you know. 
one or the other one uh, will eventually you know, gain uh, uh, prevalence. I think the specialists will be held on to very tightly by uh, the, the premium segment. They will provide, you know, uh, exceptional levels of support and uh, whatever it takes to hang on to their very largest customers. And then the rest of the market, which is, is quite a bit bigger, will be um, the domain of uh, the implant directs and the, uh, and the glide wells and, and the uh, new events and so forth, will be, uh, you know, uh, going through uh, uh, the tools that we have, like education, support, after sales support, and being able to offer a full line. Most important, I think, I mean, we have an advantage of having a very large full service laboratory. So if you need the implant, no problem. If the implant, as you know, is just a little piece of the, of the puzzle, at the end of the day, you got to restore that, that case. So if you want it restored, we can provide, and that's what we do, we provide a lot of bundles for it. Like if you want to uh, restore it to a screw retain crown and the implant and it's this much money. It's much, it'll cost you this much. This is, we do the same thing with got surgical guide bundles and so forth. Here's your treatment plan, your implant, your healing your button, your impression coping. Here you go. You're ready to go. And this is the price. And uh, that I think bundling after sale support and, and providing a full service laboratory behind it is, is going to be the trend. At least I'm invested in that model. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be, I think it really is. I, I, I'm not being facetious. I think it's really going to be a very interesting next few years as everyone tries to digest what the, what the landscape is and uh, you know, how the premium companies position themselves with more and more competition from mid to, to value implant uh, companies. It's going to be uh, maybe, maybe some more consolidation. I don't know uh, how many more mid-tier and value implant companies we need. And uh, at, at the other end, um, there's a market share for the premiums to get small enough to where we don't have room for five or six premiums anymore, at least in the U.S. market. We'll see. Yeah, I think, you know, as it, it'll be interesting uh, over the next 10 years from now, as the landscape of, uh, you know, most of the implants in the U.S. being placed by specialists is going to shift to most of the implants in the U.S. being placed by general dentists. And then I think you're going to have an, an opposite shift of, you know, most of the implants being sold are by premium brands. And then most of the implants being sold are by these these middle um, middle tier implant systems where, um, you know, they may be half the cost. And that might also include a cover screw and or a healing abutment. And that also might include an educational pathway for a general dentist that might not be available through the premium brands. That, you know, these these middle tier companies might also be able to provide support and marketing um, where the um, other premium brands are, are still holding on to, you know, kind of yesterday's years and, and philosophies. And so I, I think Glidewell is positioned nicely to have you know, the laboratory support, training facility they have, the years of experience that, that you have, that, that Jack Hahn has, that the, the whole team of implantology, um, you know, department that you guys have heading that and saying, okay, here's, here's where it, it's been and here's where it's trending. And we're going to continue to provide all levels of, of support with that. Um, and, and as you're saying, you know, the ability to bundle, the, the ability to provide training and support is, is a huge deal to the general dentist. And, um, you know, the, the implant is just one small part of that. And, and I think implant companies need, need to understand that, you know, help, help me restore the mouth, help me restore the prosthetics, help me treat the whole patient, not just sell me a screw um, and, and move on. And I think the people that get that are going to be the ones really, um, you know, making, making hay in, in the next, uh, in the next years to come. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, obviously I've got a horse in the race as far as that goes, but, but I, I do, I do think so. I mean, it's, it's the after sale support. And that, which, I mean, for a large, very large uh, premium impact company, you know, of course, they can support all surgeons and, and people with large practices. But when you get down to someone who places an implant or two a month, is proficient at placing implants, to get to de uh, dedicate a lot of support to them, you know, maybe uh, is, is difficult because, you know, they're, they're, they're tending to their, their largest customers. Whereas, uh, you know, we see them anyway. Because not only do we do an implant with them, you know, they're doing night guards. And, and small appliances, and they're doing removable parcels, and which should be an implant, by the way. And uh, you know, they're doing who knows what with us already. So we already have kind of a relationship with the customer in most cases. And we're 
Okay, and now we do implants as well, kind of uh, uh, relationship. And if you want to, want to know how to do implants, or you want to know how to do larger cases, or if you want to, you know, uh, go to come to a seminar on uh, case acceptance and so forth, we can help with that. Yeah, I, I think Glybol's ability to provide, uh, you know, the the whole solution to the package is going to be very helpful. You know, like you said, and and you've already got customers anyway, so why not go that next level and say, hey, we're, we can help you with that too. Um, so. You know, definitely you guys have a great team there. I, I'd love to, you know, digest all this and get it processed and get this posted and then, um, you know, maybe follow up with you again sometime and, and you know, go go deeper in some more aspects. You know, we didn't even get to materials uh, for prosthetics and all that. So maybe we'll have to do a follow up on, um, you know, the, the prosthetics and, you know, all the types of. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Prosthetics. We, we, we could really go down the rabbit hole. On that one yeah. Sure. So. So I'll, I'll earmark you for a follow-up, Grant, and, and we'll just talk about prosthetics next time um, because I know, oh, good. I know you've got a great mind and you're, um, you know, you're willing to share, and, and, and I really truly appreciate that, and, and I, I really respect um, you know, everything you're doing and, and, and everything Glidewell's doing with, with uh, the Han implant and the prosthetics department. I, I love your full large Bruxer um, restorations. It's, um, you know, it, it's really opened up doors for implantologist to uh to do more and treat better and, and i and i respect that about your company so i uh i commend you guys for all your work well, well thank you thank you for all that i i really enjoy talking with you it's been a lot of fun i really i had a good time and i'm hoping the, the listeners can, can get something out of the uh the podcast for, for the listening time so yeah let's just do it again sometime sounds great well grant i appreciate your time i know you've uh you're probably on your lunch break and got to get back at it so um Really appreciate your time with me today. We'll follow back up again someday. And uh, next time I'm out in California there, I'll, I'll swing by. I've been to Glidewell a couple times, so um, I'll swing back by and meet you again, and we can all kind of gather up and kind of talk shop again, okay? Sounds good. See you then. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>